So we are going to be going through the basics of investments today. This is being brought to you by Modern Money Education, which is an education platform for financial literacy. We offer courses, webinars, books, workplace education, those types of things. I am Angela Moore. I'm a certified financial planner. I also have a master's degree in financial planning, and I'm also a certified financial education instructor. I am the founder of Modern Money Education and the co-owner, as well as a practicing financial planner in Modern Money Advisor, which is our other business, which focuses on financial planning for young professionals. So with that, let me get started. So before you start investing, there's some key things that you need to know. There's some things that you really need to focus on. And those things are liquidity, your goals, and having something to invest. Before we dive into all of this information, I just want to put this disclaimer out there. We are not giving investment recommendations at all in this presentation. This is just educational in nature. And you want to make sure when you are looking for investment advice that you work with a professional for that advice. So with that, um, a little bit about me. I wasn't always a financial advisor. I actually have an accounting background and accounting degree. And right out of college, I went into the car business and was a finance manager at a dealership. And I would have people coming in all the time to finance their vehicles. And I just started noticing that a lot of people didn't have money saved. A lot of people didn't understand how their credit works, all those different things. And even myself, you know, with an accounting background, I really didn't know how much should I be saving? How should I be investing? How do I do my own taxes? I really didn't know any of that. And so I ended up working with a financial planner who basically changed my whole life around. And I decided I wanted to become a financial advisor as well. And I did. And I've been a financial advisor for, I think, close to 15 years now. And one of the things that I've learned throughout my career as a financial planner is that there is a huge lack of financial literacy. We go through high school and college and med school and grad school and law school, and no one's ever taught us about personal finance. So about a year ago, we launched Modern Money Education, and it is focused on educating young professionals about personal finance. So with that, let's jump in. So before you start investing, you need to consider your liquidity needs. Liquidity means how much you need to have access to your cash. You don't want to take money that you need in the short term and invest it in the market because the market can go up and down and all around and all over the place. And let's say you need that money and the market's currently down. You don't want to have to be pulling out money out of the market while it's down. So you, you know, normally what we recommend is that you keep your emergency fund liquid, which would be anywhere from six to 12 months of living expenses, more or less, depending on your situation, plus any money that you're going to need in the short term. So let's say you're planning on buying a house in six months, or you're planning on making a big purchase or going back to school or getting married, and you're going to need a certain amount of money, you want to go ahead and keep that liquid as well. And when I say liquid and in cash, I mean in a, like a high yield savings account, for example, that would be a great place to keep that money. And you need to understand what you're using that money for, right? Part of it is an emergency fund. Part of it is for certain goals. You want to know what am I going to be using this money for? Secondly, before you begin investing, you always want to invest based on your goals. This is one of the biggest mistakes I see people make. So many people choose investments based on per past performance and they don't look at what am I trying to accomplish? You know, why am I investing? What, is, what am I trying to achieve with these investments? So, you know, a lot of times someone may ask, you know, are you investing for retirement or are you investing to buy an apartment complex in five years? Are you investing for your child's education? What is it you're investing for? When are you going to need that money? How much are you going to need, right? Then you can back into the numbers and say, okay, in order to meet this goal, I need to save X amount and I need to have this kind of investment return. I've seen a lot of people that are invested way too aggressively when they don't need to take on that much risk 
or they're too conservative. And in order for them to meet their goals, they're going to need to be a little more aggressive. So there's all the different scenarios in between, but the most important thing is focus on your goals. The other thing is you know, when you're looking at just performance, it's easy for the human element to take over and for you to be greedy. And we saw that in, you know, 2017, for example, real estate was doing extremely well. Real estate was up 30% a year. And a lot of people said, why would I invest my money elsewhere when I can, when I can buy real estate and make 30% returns, right? And so they were investing on that kind of fear of losing out fear of not being in the market at the right time, or also greed, like, hey, this 10% return over here is not good enough. I want this 30%. And so you want to be really careful about investing based on fear or greed or emotional elements. You really want to try to recenter and go back to aligning your investments with your goals. What are you trying to accomplish? The third thing you want to look at before you start investing is do you even have something to invest, right? If you're like, I really want to invest, but I have only this $5,000, right? Well, that $5,000 is probably going to need to stay in your savings account as an emergency fund. You don't want to take your last dime and invest it in the market. You need to have the foundation in place first. You want to have your emergency fund first. But it's really important. I preach about saving. I preach about budgeting, right? Because... I want people to save. The more you have saved, the more you can invest. Investment opportunities come along all the time, but will you be able to take advantage of that investment opportunity when it presents itself? Whether it's the market, whether it's real estate, whether it's starting a business, right? And not only do you need money to invest, but you also may need time and effort and expertise. So are you learning? Are you reading books? Are you attending webinars like this one, right? Are you investing the time into your investments, whatever those investments may be? So once you have the foundation in place and you're ready to get started with investing, then this is where we jump into the basics. So let's talk about the different types of investments. The important thing to know is that historically, over the long term, investors have generally made money, right? As you can see here with these squiggly lines, the markets do go up and down on a regular basis. You can lose money in the market, but typically over the long run, investors generally are rewarded for sticking with it. So let's look at the different types of investments. These are just some basics. There's more than this, but I just want to cover the basics. So the first one is a stock. A stock is just a piece of a company, a share of a company. So if I'm Facebook and I, if, if I buy a share of Facebook, I now own a piece of Facebook, right? If Facebook were to divide its equity up in a million pieces and I buy five shares, I've now bought five pieces of face. I am now technically a part owner of Facebook. That's all a stock is. A bond on the other hand is a loan let's say that I am the state of Florida and I want to build a huge bridge, but I don't have the money to build the bridge. So I'm going to issue a bond and I'm going to hope that investors lend me that money to build the bridge. And in return, I'm going to promise to pay them back at a certain time. It could be five years, it could be 20 years, 30 years, whatever. I'm going to pay the bond back at a certain time. And in the meantime, I'm going to pay interest to these people who are letting me borrow this money. I'm going to pay them interest for allowing me to borrow this money. So with a bond, sometimes you'll see, you know, you may buy a bond for $100,000, let's say. What you're doing is you're lending $100,000. And in return, that company or that government is going to pay you back interest. And at the end of that term, they're going to pay you your money back. Now. Stocks and bonds are basically a way for companies and governments to raise money for a certain project, for example. So 
a company that's issuing stocks, it's because they're trying to get money to grow their company. Maybe they want to hire more people. Maybe they want to build more office buildings. Maybe they want to develop a new product, whatever it is, they need money. So the owners of that company are selling off some of their share in the company to raise that money so that they can invest it to grow the business. A bond is the exact same thing, except they're borrowing the money instead of selling off a piece of their company. The difference is important to know because with a stock, if that company goes out of business or goes bankrupt, technically you could lose all of your money in that you have invested in that company. Uh, whereas with a bond, if a company were to file bankruptcy, typically bondholders are high up on the balance sheet and typically get paid out as one of the top creditors. So generally speaking, bonds, generally speaking, are more conservative than stocks. That's not always the case, but as a general concept, that is the way it works. So let's dive a little deeper. What's a mutual fund? A mutual fund simply is a bundle of these different investments. So a mutual fund, for example, could have 200 different stocks in it or 500 different stocks in it, or it could have a hundred different types of bonds in it, or it could have stocks and bonds. It could have basically anything you want it to have. And it's usually put together by professional money managers. So usually these people have PhDs, they have CFAs, which is a certified financial analyst. And it, it'll be a team of people who are researching and figuring out what to put, what investments to put together in this mutual fund. Because they are researching on your behalf and because they have expenses, they have to pay for their research. They have to pay for their buildings and their light bill and all their employees and everything. They do charge fees to do this. So you're, char you're paying a fee for this service of them basically putting the investment together for you. In addition, whenever you trade a mutual fund, it typically doesn't trade until the end of the day, usually around 8 p.m., for example. Then if we look at an index fund, an index fund is similar, except it's not as actively managed. So with a mutual fund, there's people sitting there and they're, you know, buying and selling and trading and watching the market and all of that. With an index fund, typically they are just putting together a fund that follows a certain index. It could be the S&P 500, for example, which are the 500 most actively traded stocks on the market, or it could be the Barclays Bond Index, for example. So it could just be a, a list of different investments. They put it together, but then they're not really actively trading or managing it or anything. And because they're not actively trading and managing it, typically an index fund has very, very low fees. Now, an ETF is an exchange traded fund. This is kind of a newer type of investment. And with an ETF, usually these are also structured by a team of professionals. Sometimes they follow an index, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they will use research and strat different strategies to put together an exchange traded fund. But then once it's put together, they're not actively managing it. So again, you get the benefit of the low fees, but you still get the benefit of kind of having a strategy in place. So that's how an exchange traded fund, another unique aspect of an exchange traded fund is that they trade on the market. So if you sell that ETF right now, it will sell immediately. You don't have to wait till the end of market or close at 8 p.m. for that to trade. So let's say you're trying to trade that before prices fluctuate, you can trade an ETF now versus waiting, which obviously gives you a lot more control over price fluctuations throughout the day. So other types of investments, right? There's a million other types of investments. I've just listed a few here. Investing in real estate could be another type of investment. Investing in different businesses or franchises, for example. Investing in currencies. You can even do private type of investments and private lending and things like that. So there's a lot of different types of investments. They all have their own level of risk and their own kind of unique things to know about them. So let's talk more about when you're putting an investment portfolio together. I'm sure you've heard of don't put all your eggs in one basket, okay? When we talk about don't put all your eggs in one basket, it means, you know, having different options in place so that you're not relying on one thing. If you had all your money in real estate in 2008, guess what? You probably would have lost a ton of money, right? 
But if you had investments in different places, maybe some of those investments didn't do as bad as real estate. So the idea of diversification is this. There's no rhyme or reason. This is just so random, um, but it's just a, a visual, right? You may want to have some money in stocks, all different types of stocks, large company stocks, small company stocks, international stocks. You may want to have some money in bonds, right? Corporate bonds, international bonds, government bonds, municipality bonds, different types of bonds, right? You may want to have real estate, different types of real estate. Maybe you own apartment complexes. Maybe you own a strip mall. Maybe you also own a real estate investment trust or a REIT, right? Cash. You may want to have some money in a savings account and maybe you have a money market and maybe you have some CDs and then commodities. Maybe you have, you know, oil and copper and uh, gold and palladium and uh, natural resources like timber or whatever. You can have a million different types of investments in your portfolio. And the more diversified you are, the better, because if something were to happen to one of your holdings, it wouldn't affect you as much if you don't have a ton of money in that one holding. And a great example is uh, that I always give is Hewlett Packard and also BP Oil, right? BP Oil was one of the UK's number one performing stocks, always paid a great dividend, all these different things. But then the oil spill happened and you guessed it, that stock went plummeting when that oil spill happened. So if you had all your money in BP Oil because you thought it was a great investment and then all of a sudden, unbeknownst to you or anyone else for that matter, they have a big oil spill, you have no control over that. It's just like with Hewlett Packard years ago, their CEO stepped down. Uh, there was like a scandal and all of a sudden Hewlett Packard didn't have a CEO. And guess what happened? The stock went plummeting. So you always want to be diversified and have different types of investments to kind of help you stabilize your portfolio. If we look at this, this is just a year by year chart from 2005 to 2019, random different market scenarios based on how you invested. If we look at, for example, 2017, right? 2017, international emerging markets were doing extremely well. They were up 37%. Small company stocks, small cap stocks were up almost 32%. But then if you look at the very next year, those two investments were down at the very bottom. So we really don't know how the market is going to perform. Analysts usually will give estimates and they'll, you know, project certain things, but we don't ever know what's really going to happen. Another example is if you look at 2007, right? 2007, again, emerging markets was up 39%. 2008, one year later, emerging markets was down 53%. You might have said, let me get out of these emerging market stocks. This is horrible. But then if you got out of it, look at 2009. It was up 79%. The important thing to take away from this is to always stay diversified. Every piece of the pie plays its role. It's very important. It's important to have bonds. It's important to have stocks. It's important to have emerging markets. And so all of it. You want to have all of it and you want to stay diversified in line with your risk tolerance, which I'll talk about in a second. The other thing, how to know if you're properly diversified is to look at the correlation. A correlation is just how do two different investments, like what is the relationship between them? Do they do the same thing or are they opposite or do they do their own random things? That's important to look at. If you tell me, Angela, I have a very diversified portfolio. I have over 300 different stocks. I will tell you that portfolio is not diversified because all your money is in stocks. Okay, because a lot of stocks will do the same exact thing when the stock market is down, almost all stocks are down. So you want to have different types of investments that have either low correlation or opposite correlation. Now, the benefits of diversification are your performance. Okay, if you have a well diversified portfolio, studies show that you will outperform someone who is very concentrated over time because it's just hard to pick the right investments all the time. So this is just an example of that. In addition, these are different sample portfolio allocations. Th this is not something for you to go follow this and invest your money like this, but this just shows like based on how you're invested, 
it does affect your risk tolerance. Your risk tolerance should affect the way you're invested is actually what I should say. And you can still be very diversified. Even if you're conservative or you're aggressive, you still have a little bit of money in all these different buckets and all these different types of investments. So let's look at standard deviation. Standard deviation is how we measure the volatility, right? Investments go up and investments go down. What is the average that they go up and down, right? So for the S&P 500, which is the 500 most actively traded stocks in the market, for example, the average volatility of what they go up and down is 19.7%. So they go up 19%, down 19%, and everything everywhere in between, right? So here you can see there's volatility. Every time something happens, whether it's a headline in the news or the president has done this or there's been an oil or, you know, whatever things happen, it usually affects the market and the market's up and down every single day and there's volatility involved. So what you have to figure out is how much volatility or how much risk are you comfortable with? And then what you want to do is try to have a disciplined approach and stick with it. You don't want to be reacting emotionally to every swing in the market. And when you do react emotionally, it can hurt you. If you say, oh my goodness, the market is declining. I'm going to pull out all my money out of the market. And you end up missing the best day in the market before you get back in. That can affect you by several thousand dollars, as you see here, if you just missed one of the best days. If you missed five of the best days in the market, you could potentially miss out on a ton of money. If you missed 25 of the best days, you're significantly impacting your returns at that point. So you really, really want to be sure to have a disciplined and strategic approach. This is finances we're talking about. It's not supposed to be emotional. It's supposed to be strategic. It's supposed to be business-minded. It's supposed to be mathematical. It's supposed to be analytical. You know, you kind of want to try your best to take your emotions out of anything financial, but especially investing. So let's talk a little bit about what a robo-advisor is, because robo-advisors really do help you take the emotional part out of it. It's basically a robot. So robots don't have um, emotions, right? So nowadays, there's all these robo-advisors out there. And basically what they are, they're artificial intelligent and automated investment portfolios. Usually there'll be like an app or something. You'll go in, you'll answer questions. They'll ask you questions about your tolerance for risk. When are you gonna need this money? You know, all these different things. And based on how you answer those questions, it will uh, present you with a recommended investment portfolio. You can then invest in that and it does everything for you. Why is that so great? It's because it takes the emotional side out of it. You're not having to look at it every day. You're not having to do it. You know, it's doing it for you based on how you answered the questions. And it does, you know, make life a little bit easier. The other thing that's great about robo advisors is they're typically very inexpensive. So usually the fees are very low. They usually use exchange traded funds, which I talked about exchange traded funds are a great way to have a lot of different investments at a low price and have like a very strategic approach. Um, robo advisors are easy. There's no experience necessary. And usually there's low minimum. Some of them have like a $5,000 minimum. Some of them have a $50 minimum. So pretty much anyone at any level can get started with a robo advisor. If you wanna know what some of them are, um, just off the top of my head, there's Betterment, Wealthfront, Schwab Intelligent, portfolio. There's Elvest. I don't know. There's, there's a ton of them. If you just Google robo advisor, you'll see there's a ton of them out there. So what if you are trying to select your own investments and let's say you want to select mutual fund, for example, mutual funds have fact sheets, and this is a random example. So don't look at this and it's old too. I did that on purpose. So what I look at when I'm looking at a fact sheet, if I am investing this way, normally I would look at the investment approach. What is this fund's objective? Who's managing it? So who's on the investment team? What kind of performance have they had? Their Morningstar rating or their overall rating? How much does this fund cost? How are they performing relative to the benchmark? Alpha, how much are they adding in return relative to similar investments? Beta, and then also standard deviation, which we said was risk, right? So 
this is just an example. Like it tells you everything right here. Super easy. This fund has an investment approach to seek high quality established and emerging companies with sustainable competitive advantages, strong cash flow, blah, 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 right? They focus on long-term growth, says right here. They focus on long-term growth rather than short-term. And they have a stock selection informed by rigorous fundamental analysis. And then it says here what their objective is. They want to have long-term capital appreciation, another word for growth, long-term growth, by investing in growth-oriented equities, which is stocks, of large companies. It's pretty easy. Their team, their investment team, hey, these these people have been there since 1998. This person's been there since 2002. Overall, they have over, you know, 100 years of experience between them. Here's the past performance, right? Here. So, and here's the Morningstar rating. Like this is a five star, which is five stars, the best rating you can get. So you can kind of look through these fact sheets and see, you know, the other thing is how much does it cost? The prices right here, this right here, these prices are based on the total amount you invest. So if you invest $10,000, you would pay, depending on what type of share you buy, like in C share is very common. You would pay 1.64% per year on however much you invest. The other thing here that you can look at is the benchmark that they're comparing it to. You can look at alpha. So this fund is earning on average 3% more than its benchmark. Its standard deviation is 15%. So it has a higher level of volatility and risk than its benchmark. So that's something to look at. So it has higher return, but it also has higher risk. So those are things you want to look at as you're researching an investment. I think a question came in and I will answer it at the end. Fees and expenses. This is very important for you to focus on and to know. Sometimes it's easy to kind of not understand what the fees are. If you ever have questions, you know, meet with your financial advisor or your investment person and ask them straight out, what are all the fees that I'm paying on these investments? There may be different kinds of fees in the investments that you own. There may also be account fees, potentially. There's a lot of places that have no account fees, but then there's other places that do have account fees. So you need to know, am I paying account fees? Trading fees. Every time you trade something, there may be a fee to trade, to buy, or to sell. Management fees. If someone's managing those investments for you, there may be fees for that. There may be legal fees, depending on what type of investments you're doing, right? If Let's say you're buying a business or something like that. There could be legal fees. And then there could also be maintenance expenses. You may see that inside your 401k, for example. So it's a good idea for you to be aware of how much am I paying and to actually do the numbers. Some fees may seem high, but then when you compare it, when you actually do the math, it may be low compared to other fees. So you want to do the math and see what is the actual dollar amount you would be paying total to invest in said investments. And then lastly, this is huge, last but not least, because this is very important, is risk considerations. What kind of risk do you want to take in your investment portfolio? Do you want to be super conservative? Do you want to be super aggressive? You know, what kind of roller coaster ride do you want to be on? And so when we look at volatility again, it's the up and down, the up and down. Do you kind of want to have a smooth ride or do you want to have a ride that's all over the place? Do you want to take on more risk for potentially higher returns or would you settle for lower returns in order to have safety and comfort? There's no right or wrong answer here. It's all about what are you trying to achieve and what are you comfortable with? Again, like I said in the beginning, you always want to also focus on your goals. You know, what kind of risk do I need to take to reach my goals? And what is my time horizon? If you have a super long time until you need this money, you can afford to take on more risk. But if you need this money in a short period of time, let's say you need this money in three years, then you probably want to be way more conservative with it. And then you also, like I said in the beginning, want to take into consideration your need for liquidity. So why, this is just so important. Why should we follow a disciplined investment approach? Because we're human and we have emotions <laughs> and we tend to make emotional decisions. You know, for lack of a better way to put it, you want to check yourself. If you find yourself getting angsty and, or, you know, getting aggressive because you're being greedy, you kind of want to know that about yourself and you want to pay attention to the money scripts that you're telling, the things that you're telling yourself, right? And so here's some 
examples of why people tend to make mistakes when they're investing. It has nothing to do with knowing what to do. It has everything to do with the emotional side of things. And I've seen this in my, oh my goodness, I've seen this. So here's an example visually, right? Let's say the market's going up and you're just feeling good. Like, yeah, I know what I'm doing. Made the right investments. I'm killing the game, right? You're up here. You're making all this money. You feel good. You're like bragging about it to everybody. Look at all this money I made in the market. But then it starts going down and you start getting unsure. Like, wait, it's not doing so well anymore. I'm starting to get nervous. What should I do, right? And then it goes all the way down and you panic. And you're like, get me out of this investment, sell everything. I'm scared. I might lose all my money. I might end up with nothing. And so what happens is a lot of times people will buy right here under optimism or elation. And then when they start getting nervous and fearful, they sell. So what have you done? You have bought high and you have sold low. You're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to buy low, sell high, right? You want to make a profit. You don't want to make a loss. So you just want to be cognizant of if you are doing this. This is such a simple concept, but a lot of people make this mistake right here. A lot, a lot of people, they make this mistake. And as we navigate these volatile market environments and everything that's going on in the world, this is so important now more than ever is to have a strategy in place that fits your needs, fits your tolerance for risk, and then try your best to stick with it. So. How do you do that? You focus on what you can control. None of us control the market. I don't control the market, okay? I can't promise you a certain return. Nobody can, and you can't either. So you have to focus on what you can control. What you can control is that you've done a thorough analysis of your personal financial situation. You've looked at what are my goals? How much can I save? What is my tolerance for risk? What is my time horizon? And then you put an investment plan in place to fit all of those needs. You also structure a portfolio that is well diversified. You look at the cost of investing. You make sure that you're managing the expenses associated with how you're investing. You also want to pay attention to how is it going to affect you from a tax perspective. If you already have a you know complex tax situation, then there's also tax implications of investing certain ways that you want to look at. And, you know, I would recommend working with a credentialed financial advisor who will take a big picture approach and look at all those things with you. And then last but not least, stay disciplined throughout market dips and swings, especially if you have a long time horizon, you know, know that, hey, this is a moment in time, things will change but I have a good strategy in place. I've looked at my goals. I've looked at my risk tolerance and what I'm doing is comfortable to me and I'm going to you know, stick with this. Reacting or not sticking with it can hurt you. And I think I already showed this slide, so I will skip this. So with that, I'm about to open it up to questions. And I think there's already a few questions that have come in, but just so you know, um, if you would like to, contact us or view some of our courses, you can do so at modernmoney.education. Also, we have a free course that personally I think is amazing and it's called Secure the Bag in 15 Days. It's a course that gives you bit by bit uh, steps to saving more money. And it's delivered to you in a 15 day period, one piece at a time per day. And you can sign up for that by going to our website at modernmoney.education or by going to this bit.ly link right here. And one more thing before I go to questions, we also have a money mastermind that is incredible. It's a small group course. It's live. It's not like a recorded self-paced thing. It's live. And we go through all the basics of personal finance with a heavy focus on behavioral finance or the emotional side of money. So it's amazing. And it, the information is on our website. So what I'm going to do now is that I am going to unshare my screen and I'm going to open it up for questions. So here are some questions. Should a person wait to invest after they have saved six to 12 months of living expenses, or is it advised to do them at the same time? So in terms of investing, if you have a 401k where you have an employer match on your contributions, I definitely say take advantage of the employer match. Outside of that, I would recommend 
definitely saving your emergency fund first before you start investing. You need to make sure you have money in place for emergencies and for things that can happen. You don't want to be taking money you need and putting it into the market. And then if you need it, having to pull it out at the wrong time. So the emergency fund is one of the first things you should focus on from a financial standpoint before everything else. Um, so I hope that answers. And then what is a good annual percentage yield for a high, high yield savings account? That's a great question. This changes constantly. Literally a few months ago, you could get like 1.7%. Um, now I'm seeing like 0.3% and 0.4%. So it does change constantly. And you, you can go on like bankrate.com or nerd wallet resources like that. And you can search on Google for um, highest paying interest rates or high, highest high yield savings accounts, things like that. And you can see on a monthly basis, which banks are paying the most. And then if you have an emergency fund, let's say you have $75,000 sitting in your emergency fund and you're like, oh my goodness, I'm not making any money on this. You definitely want to consider looking at a high yield savings account to park that money so that you're at least making some kind of money um, on that money that's sitting there. So the next question is, so someone asked, is it smart to keep my short-term savings, six months of living expenses in a high yield savings account or better to keep in a regular savings account? Um, whichever one pays the most interest, <laughs> get, get as much money as you can for that. Uh, the next question, is it better to use dollar cost averaging or lump sum when investing? Great question. So dollar cost averaging is when you are putting in a certain amount of money on a consistent, routine, systematic basis. So let's say every month you're putting $500 into the market versus doing a lump sum of saying, hey, I have $100,000, I'm going to put it into the market, right? Taking a lump sum of money and putting it into the market today is kind of high risk because you don't know where the market is right now. Is it at a high? Is it at a low? What if you put all this money in today and then the market tanks tomorrow? Then you've lost a ton of money. So by consistently saving and investing over time, um, you're spreading out the risk. You're putting some money in here, some money here, some money there, some, you know, all over the place. And so over time, you're entering the market at different price points and you're diversifying your entry point, which makes it like less risky in terms of investing at the high of the market. So that's a great question, Bradley. Uh, another question, we, and if you have questions, feel free to put them in the chat or the Q&A now and I will answer, I'll try to get to all of these questions. Um, the next question, does it make sense to use apps like Robin stock to buy half a stock or is it better to save a larger sum of money so you can buy a few shares at a time so um i really believe in diversification as i said so you know i think it's easier to get better diversification when you are investing in uh like mutual funds or exchange traded funds and things like that it can sometimes take a large sum of money to be able to properly diversify if you're buying individual stocks, because some stocks have a very, very high price point, you know, like, like Google, for example, or, or Amazon, I don't know what the prices are right now, but typically it would be hard to get proper diversification buying those individual shares. So you can get a lot more diversification by investing in like robo advisors or exchange traded funds, mutual funds, things like that. So any other questions? I don't see any other questions. Um, so if you want to ask, even if it's not related to investments, feel free to ask and I will be happy to um, answer. Oh, here's another question. At what point should someone hire a financial advisor? So... <laughs> I feel like, you know, if you have questions or you just feel like a one-on-one -on -one approach would really help you, or if you feel like you need accountability or you need, you need someone to help teach you, or you're just unsure, like, am I saving enough? Am I investing the right way? Um, do I have all the proper legal? Like, if you just have questions, hiring a financial advisor 
is great because they can really help you address all of the different pain points in your situation. They can help you um, understand certain things you may be missing. Like a huge thing that a lot of people miss is estate planning. Most people have not done any estate planning. They don't understand what it is. They don't understand why it's important and why they should have it. And by hiring a financial advisor, they can pinpoint certain things that maybe you have not focused on that you should be focusing on. And I think that everyone should hire a financial advisor personally. So, you know, it's just like, I don't know, it's like hiring a doctor. Like, do you self-diagnose yourself or do you go into a professional and say, hey, you know, what should I be doing? What should I, you know, what medicines should I be taking? Which, uh, you know, vitamins or whatever. So I think everyone should have a financial advisor. And honestly, I don't think there's a time that's too soon. I, I think that as soon as you graduate college, you should be trying to go find someone to get you on track and to help you develop a financial plan. And then periodically, you want to revisit that maybe every year, maybe every few years, you go back and say, am I still on track? Am I doing the right things? What else should I be looking at? Right? Because our situations are constantly evolving and constantly changing. Um, here's another question. How do we know how much money to keep liquid versus how much to invest? Should it be a percentage of monthly income? So I normally recommend that you keep at least six to 12 months of living expenses. So when you do your budget, also we, ha we do have a budget template on our website. If you go to modernmoney.education, you can download our free budget template. You can fill in all your expenses per month. And then that will tell you how much do I need per month to live on. Whatever that amount is, you multiply that times six or times 12. You want to have six to 12 months, depending on how consistent your income is. If you have a job that's very consistent, you have very low risk of losing your job, that kind of thing, maybe you only need six months. If you have a job that fluctuates a lot or you may be, you know, you might lose that contract or lose that that um, project, then maybe you want to have more money saved. But I would say six to 12 months plus anything you need in the short term. So let's say, for example, I have six months of savings of living expenses saved. Plus I plan on buying a property in six months and I need $50,000 to buy that property. So then I'm going to have my six months of emergency fund plus the $50,000 that I need to put down on that property I'm going to buy. And then any extra savings I have outside of that, I may consider investing. And you can have different investment portfolios. Like you could have a different portfolio for every single goal. So I could have a portfolio for my real estate investments. I could have a portfolio for um, paying for a future wedding. I could have a portfolio to pay for my child's college, whatever. And each portfolio could have different goals and different time horizon. So you can invest, you know, based on your goals, but also then keeping liquidity. I don't look at it as a percentage of monthly income until you, like, let's say you already have the money you need for your emergency fund. Then after that, you can say, hey, I want to put, you know, 10% in this portfolio and 10% in this portfolio and 50% in this, this one and 20% of my income in my 401k or my retirement, right? You can then allocate and you can automate all of that. So I hope that answers the question. Um, here's another question. Are there benefits to buying CDs or is this outdated? It depends on what the interest rates are. If you're going to go buy a CD and lock your money in for six months or for a year, it should be worth it. You should be getting a certain amount of interest. If you can go put that same money into a money market or a high yield savings account and make the same amount of money, why would you lock your money up for a year or two in a CD? So I don't think it's outdated, but I think it heavily has to do with what interest rates are and what those CDs are paying. If you can get a CD paying 8%, it would make all the sense in the world. But if you're getting a CD and it's only paying 0.20%, why would you do that when you could just put your money in a savings account and make the exact same amount? So, so CDs can be beneficial. It just depends on what they're paying and what the terms are and stuff like that. So I don't see any other questions. If you have any other questions, feel free to type them in. Otherwise... Thank you for attending this, uh, this webinar. I appreciate all of you coming and I will send out the invest, uh, I'm sorry, the recording of this. Um, and so if you wanna share it with anyone, feel free. I will also probably be doing other webinars. So please follow us on social media, Modern Money Education, 
or join our email list, you can join our email list by going to our website, modernmoney.education and getting the free budget planner or enrolling in the free course. By doing that, you're subscribing to our email list. And when we do have webinars and stuff, we will notify you. So anyways, thank you so much. Have a great day. And I look forward to seeing you all very soon. Bye.